Hey, good morning. Uh, it's great for me to be here. I have to say on a personal note, I'm originally from Texas. Spent the last 13 years out in Asia, and it's always good to kind of come home. And given the agenda and the topics today, this is really uh, exciting. So what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, open port and how we're using decentralized ledger technology to speed up cash flow in the supply chain for financial benefits to the companies involved and also for a more sustainable uh, social environment, including all the way down to the driver level. So th the problem we focus on you know, since we started the company was how the paper process really slows down everything. Uh, similar to the last excellent uh, presentation, uh, this is across markets, across industries, and certainly across supply chains. We see a commonality there. And realistically, in, particularly in emerging markets, uh, the business problem is very sizable. Uh, really, Indonesia, really, you're, you're looking at 25% of GDP is logistics, broadly speaking, compared to 10 or 11% in the US. And a lot of the reason is because the paper-based system combined with fragmentation just slows everything down. And it really delays cash flow, not just in the transportation side, but also on the retail side. Also from the, from the retailer to the brand owner. So if you take Unilever Philippines as an example, 1.3% of their top line, which in that country is 2 billion US dollars per year, they can't even invoice because they don't get the proof of delivery back. So if they can't invoice, they're definitely not paying the trucker. I can guarantee you that. So our focus is really on Asia. Uh, we're expanding at the moment in North America and uh, actually looking at, at North American capital markets as well. Uh, but our really experience and focus as a company is on emerging Asia. So the solution is to use blockchain, broadly speaking, to really focus on a specific use case, which is confirming exactly what happened. Confirming exactly who, down to the driver, uh, delivered exactly what, down to what SKUs, exactly when. And as, as we've piloted this concept in different markets, one of the challenges we've run into is drivers in India, Philippines, don't have smartphones. So how can we work around that? Well, we've also, combine that problem with the fact that the data is not coming back fast enough to pilot micro incentives. So this means for guys that are making 400, 500 US dollars a month, that we take a small part of the freight invoice value and we pass it directly to the driver for doing what the supply chain wants to see. And we've in Philippines started loaning phones to drivers and they pay back the loans with Micro incentives. So it's a great story. These guys get to go home with a little higher tech handset and the whole supply chain works better. So this, we believe, fundamentally changes business to business goods transfers, focused on payments initially on the transport cycle. So really you've got your paper-based world and you've got then your blockchain world. So in the paper-based world, it's email, you're faxing, you're printing out your delivery order from SAP. Great system for managing your general ledger, not a great system for connecting with truckers. Uh, so then things are lost. Once It's okay if you've got 10 shipments uh, a week. Once you've got 10,000 shipments a day across Asia Pac, you've got a problem. You don't know what's going on anymore. So our solution is digital real-time from any transporter. So then if you look on the, on the payment side, the transporters are not paid on time. Drivers and laborers are not incentivized. So they're siphoning gas, they're doing bad things instead of doing what they should be doing. The shippers themselves, the world's largest companies, are overpaying for transportation and they're underpaying, they're, they're, they're underpaid for the goods that they're sold. So we want and are offering now uh, next day payments, micro rewards, and a real-time irrefutable electronic proof of delivery. So we go from doubt, delay, and risk to trust with accelerated cash flow. So we've been piloting this originally as a commercial company. And that's a company that has a SaaS product, it's cloud-based, it's a tech stack for enterprise, it integrates with SAP and large corporates. And that company, OpenPort, really uses blockchain and the centralized way uh, to large shareholder value. But when, the more we get into the power of decentralized ledger technology, I'm not sure that 
the protocol itself belongs with a company which is oriented towards driving shareholder value. And the foundation approach really allows us to structure a big tent. Uh, this really allows us also to build a global alliance and to work with anybody in Africa, in markets where OpenPort doesn't have a presence. And as a result, we've restructured what we're doing into, into two companies, which is a little bit complex. But it believe, we believe this allows us to, to build the products and to drive the solutions uh, that we want to achieve in terms of sustaining a improved ecosystem. So one company is going, going public, uh, has software, and is expanding globally with local partners. The other is a nonprofit foundation. Uh, this is building a side chain, uh, mostly on, on Ethereum, but also working with other protocols, and has an agreement with OpenPort. So mostly as OpenPort, we work with consumer goods companies. We work also increasingly with logistics companies and focus on driving large segments of their supply chain and improving cash flow around it. So some of the companies that we work with uh, typically move consumer goods to access billions of consumers, uh, four billion of whom are in the Asia Pacific region, actually. So it's, it's the Unilevers, it's the Nestle's, the P&G's, uh, the Colgate's of the world. So we're excited about how we allow them to control their costs, really to work with any transporter to bypass third party logistics providers, essentially, uh, and really operate a more sustainable supply chain as well. So if we talk about the technology itself, it's a detailed electronic proof of delivery that drives, improves cash flow, it reduces uh, redundancy, uh, reduces administration, improves customer service. And what we do is, is really focus on, particularly with consumer goods, the full detail of what needs to be delivered. So if you've got, for example, one of our customers is, is a wine distributor in Shanghai. Uh, let's say they have 10 cases of wine uh, that they're delivering to Walmart. Nine cases are Yellowtail, very cheap. One case is Lafitte, right? Driver drops a case. Now you need to know, was it the Lafitte or the Yellowtail? Because you need to collect that cash from Walmart, right? So that knowing the exact code of the product, something that reconciles with your system is great. And then writing that record to the blockchain increases trust and acceptance around it. Because in all of these markets, we're moving from a paper-based system to a digital one. And there's lots of questions on what should be accepted. So although the paper process is in place in many cases for regulatory purposes, part of the payment, maybe 80% of it, can happen once the digital confirmation has taken place, once you have the blockchain consensus and a digital signature from the consignee. So this is a system that we've localized, local language, local interfaces, as WeChat for China, WhatsApp in other countries, uh, Urdu, Hindi, Bahasa Indonesia, Bahasa Malayu, uh, Tagalog, Mandarin Chinese, uh, traditional characters, et cetera, and uh, English. Now there's a lot of data that comes back. So the interactive dashboards are available to the client. They can drill down to an SKU level. They can look at the metadata. Hey, how did my shipment performance happen in this market or that market? Where were, what were the providers that performed well? Uh, and do that country by country. Ultimately, then the foundation, from a protocol perspective, is working with partners like Sweetbridge, uh, with other protocol standards such as IOTA to complement the information flow with the actual physical flow on the assets. And companies that want to work with the open source aspect of the technology can go to the foundation. Companies that want the APIs into SAP, that want the transport management system, the EPODs, they can go to OpenPort. And OpenPort uses the protocol provided by the foundation. This isn't the structure that we started with, but I think this is becoming increasingly common when we look at blockchain and really the complex between shareholder value-oriented structures and structures that are oriented towards broad acceptance of consensus and broad, as broad membership as possible. So when we look at the protocol for ourselves, we don't just want to do Nestle Philippines. It's really about uh, already four markets and then a corporate supply chain that does 10,000 complex shipments per day. So if you look at Ethereum and many other protocols today, there's a certain limit around scalability and transaction cost. So with our own protocol, building the right forks and side chaining appropriately, we can scale, we can get that cost down where the unit economics work for open port and also for other companies that want to use this technology themselves. And we put the right rewards around data sharing and collaborative governance while protecting data confidentiality. So the token itself is used to fuel smart contract validation and confirm exactly what got delivered. 
Uh, the nodes in our world are increasingly logistics companies themselves and trucking companies. We use the token for micro incentives, so it's a bonus. So it doesn't conflict with fiat currency stability requirements either by the transporter or by the driver. So they're still getting the fiat to pay their salaries and their fiat costs and household costs, but you've got an, in, an incremental uh, incentive currently with fiat currency and in the future with the token. So again, that's a token with attributes, building the security controls, uh, the speed and cost, uh, and the scalability. Building an open port ecosystem where we can control uh, ultimately the cost of consensus in the interest of members. This is a little bit about the team. Uh, structured primarily in Hong Kong from a management perspective, but with local leaders and in many cases increasingly partners uh, in Pakistan, in Philippines, in China, uh, and so on with the right type of global blockchain expertise. Uh, myself, I am really a, was a logistics guy before, before I was in tech and our management uh, board is also individuals that have a lot of experience in the logistics industry. So just want to talk about how this is working today because when we started off trying to disrupt the process and as a company, uh, I think it's a theme that venture capitalists love, right? Disrupt, you know, build IP around it and then, then protect that disruption. But what about if we just go and make life better for everybody? What if starting with the drivers? Starting with these guys that don't necessarily have a lot of take home and give them that micro incentive. And we found that this resonates really well, not just with the individuals that are moving the freight and have been bottom of the pyramid and bottom of the food chain for so long without a means or an incentive to be recognized. So that's great for them, but it's also better for the transporter. So even when the transporter is subcontracting and previously they desire to some extent to hide that behavior from their customer, they no longer have a problem with enabling the transparency of saying I subcontracted to this guy or that guy because they are being paid so much faster. And that lack of payment timeliness is such a pain for a cash heavy transport business that they're now willing to, to go transparent. And then the brand owner themselves, they're able to collect. So whether it's economies as diverse to a certain extent as Pakistan, India, China, Philippines, uh, we find that commonality is really strong. And uh, that's exciting for us. So we found that micro incentives uh, are working, first of all. We found that by doing things like loaning to the smartphones out and having them repaid with mi micro incentive, we can really make this model work. Uh, we can also just focus on the most relevant uses for smart contracts. So uh, previous presentation was, was excellent on this point. Again, you've got these accessorial charges. How do you know exactly how long this truck was waiting? Uh, how do you confirm that? Well, now by looking at exactly where the truck was and the supply chain, all the transit points, the exact delivery confirmation confirming that, and you build in that logic on what should be paid uh, with smart contracts, you validate it by consensus, and it's crystal clear. So again, the paper process can, can happen, uh, but that doesn't mean that most of the cash can't flow upfront. Uh, so that's encouraging. So the key use case for us is ultimately not just that the payment can be made faster, but that there are now a long list of financial institutions and both new startup and innovative companies utilizing blockchain technology to get in on the liquidity business, but also traditional banks. So th this was very interesting um, the first time it, it happened, but it was a mid-tier bank in the Philippines called Union Bank that says, we can't change Unilever's credit rating, right? It is what it is. We can't change a new transporter's credit rating, right? Somebody's been doing trucking for Unilever for 10 years. They have a certain credit rating with Unilever. Somebody is new off the block. They've got five trucks. That's going to be a different credit rating. So we're not going to change that, right? What we're going to do is reduce the risk of the invoice itself, right? It's a very powerful concept because what happens now is that the benchmark for getting your freight invoice paid in any country where we can deploy this model is, is, is with the system. The lowest cost of capital, right, is essentially through the open port system or any new competitive system that comes up. And that's really where I think the dial moves with blockchain. From being nice to have to 
I need this. This is the standard. And I think that will happen really with all supply chain transactions. Definitely, eventually, with international movements and letter of credit optimization. But that involves a large number of stakeholders in the international containerized supply chain. The domestic trade settlement transaction involves four or five. Chipper, consignee, transporter, subcontracted driver, and optionally a bank. All of those parties today interface with our platform. So domestic trade settlement, I think, both for the freight charges themselves, which is a great use case, and soon for the goods transfers is where we will see a race together with uh, lending institutions for bringing real blockchain solutions uh, such as ours to play. So we can reduce the cycle time, but ultimately I think it's that reduction of the discount rate, uh, a few basis points or so that is most exciting. So just to summarize, uh, we're making it real across Asia Pacific. Uh, I think when we started on blockchain, uh, and even over the last 12 months, you, we all see the skeptics saying, this doesn't work. <laughs> saying, this, there are no working models in the enterprise space with blockchain technology. And I think uh, today, uh, in this conference, not, not just with OpenPort, but we start to see the skeptics are being proven wrong. Right? And we may be or still early in the, in the adoption cycle and, and at a certain point in the Gartner hype, hype cycle, right? But there's just no questioning that this moves the dial and that the cost of capital can be improved with blockchain and that means cash flow uh, can be sped up. So the payment use cases are, are key. Uh, we're doing about six million US uh, a year now and I, this looks like it's going to triple quadruple in the next uh, only three months. Uh, new partners are joining the platform and they bring their transport business to our partnerships. And we work with other partners to bring working capital into that model. So we're really just speeding up uh, the cash flow in the supply chain across the board. So setting the new benchmark on cost of capital and logistics is, is what we find exciting. So be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Uh, IPO should be about four months, <laughs> uh, uh, TSX, not soliciting. I'm a founder, no big deal. Any other questions? Uh, I guess a couple of questions. One, um, it sounds like micro incentives are helping with the adoption yep. of getting you know parties on the on the on the blockchain. Right. Are there other elements that you're seeing or that you're employing to try to get adoption to be more seamless? And secondly, from a financial standpoint, it sounds like the cost of capital is is, is greatly reduced as yep. a result of you know ensuring the invoice payment process. Yeah. Where what are the other value drivers that you see that are going to be you know, I guess prevalent post that particular lever. Yeah, so um, I'll take the second question first, if, if you don't mind, then I'll come uh, back to the, what we're doing besides micro incentives. So if you think about a, a, a fast moving consumer goods company, you know, selling very high volumes of products across various markets, uh, I think the inefficiencies would be similar to what was covered by the last speaker in the oil and gas industry. Uh, realistically, what we've seen is around one and a half percent of the goods value uh, cannot be invoiced within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, now you've got to add in disputes, then you add in late payments, right? And then you've got non-payment. So it was really, it wasn't our original concept when we created the company. We wanted to increase transparency and all, all that type of, of great stuff, build a more e open ecosystem. But it was really companies like Procter & Gamble say, hey, Max, thanks for the visibility. Appreciate that. Uh, we got distributors that you don't believe how much cash they're holding and the excuses that were being made up. And one customer 
a friend of mine said, it's the national sport of China to dispute PODs. But I heard similar threads. So there's actually other, they might want to have an Olympics around this one because it seems there's many countries that <laughs> perceive this as, as, as their own national sport or national, a business problem. So then if, what are they spending on physical distribution? Around 2 to 3%, right? So this is an amazing uh, concept to me. Uh, it, it varies from country to country, supply chain to supply chain. But that challenge around collecting cash is sometimes as big or a bigger problem than the transport itself, where they're, they're trying to squeeze the transporters, but they're sort of doing it in, in, a, in a backwards way because the tra their capacity is limited by the, the, the slow payment process itself. So the POs don't go through us today. So the, the transport order, the delivery order, it all goes through our system, from SAP to, the, to our transport management system, optimize, consolidate it, deconsolidate it, move it to the transporter, transporter assigns to the driver, close the loop. The PO doesn't go through us. All right? It goes through other parties, and there's all kinds of factors. But I think ultimately, it's now we're starting to pass that POD back to the customer service department from, via the logistics teams or otherwise, and they can start to resolve particularly exceptional dispute cases. Uh, so I, I think the, the cost of capital is one thing on, on the freight payments, but then ultimately getting into the goods value themselves and assisting that to move more efficiently is the next phase. Uh, and you know whether that happens earlier or letter of credit optimization and international containerized movement payments can happen in, in, a, in a smoother way, we'll just have to see what it, maybe it'll all happen at the same time with interoperable blockchain protocols, let's see. <laughs> uh, so then the micro incentives for us is exciting because it fits in with the purpose of the company, uh, driving more than, than, than just making money, really making it a, a little bit of a, I think those of you that go to a lot of blockchain conferences and you heard Brock Pierce speak, uh, you know, the new billionaire is the guy that impacts the lives of a billion people positively, right? So not just about having a billion uh, of some fiat. Um, and I, I think that's obviously aspirational, but uh, I think there's a good element there. Uh, so, but by speeding up openness, and now we go from traditional factoring arrangements and liquidity payment in most markets are very selective. So you have Nestle, says with Bank of America, you can work once you're approved with this set of transporters, or once eligible, once the branch is approved, and then central finance is approved. So what we're setting up, uh, and, and it's that similar case in, in many, many countries. It, it's, it's not a many-to-many. -many. So what we want to set up is any shipper can work with any transporter that they want. Transporter needs to have a smartphone, right? No EDI, no GPS, nothing else. Well, they don't have a smartphone. They, they can't afford a smartphone. Okay, we'll loan you the smartphone. <laughs> Here's the smartphone, right? And you pay us back with micro incentives. And by the way, there are liquidity partners ready, very interested in the idea of loaning smartphones to millions of truck drivers <laughs> around Asia, right? So, 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 we, so we take the, the, that micro incentives concept and we, we try and build around it. And then the values are openness and transparency. And anybody that needs to move some stuff, they should be able to work with anybody who moves stuff. Just that simple. Hi, uh, so you mentioned SAP a few times in there. I was wondering yeah. uh, if the reason you went with that platform was just the size of uh, yeah. the market already on that platform, or if you saw that as a uh, particularly uh, well-tuned system to have a blockchain bolt on. Yeah, yeah I, might have, I might have been unclear, so thanks for asking the question. So it's, it's, it's really our corporate customers that, that are on SAP. Uh, so we, we also integrate with JD Edwards, we've done work with, with Oracle. But what we typically see, so, so with, uh, with, with Nestle, uh, you know, they started off with Nestle, uh, SAP TM in, in the U.S., and then their first market with SAP TM in the Asia-Pacific region was Pakistan, where we have a large operation. So they said, integrate here first, and then as we roll out SEP TM, then OpenPort will bolt on to that market by market. So the point is, our, the customers have various types of, of ERP platforms. And we just have to be open and connect with whatever they can give us. So that is frequently SAP, FICO, materials management, or SAP TM. But it could be something else. And nine times out of 10, we're starting with the flat file upload of the delivery order. And then we move to EDI, XML, something that's a little bit tighter. 
but, but, but that, that's the repository for where uh, customers, large corporations, build their supply chains, build the delivery orders. We take it out and we put it in the hands of anybody who moves stuff. And then we prove exactly who delivered what. Right. All right, thank you very much.